trying to decide if we want to cover Gardner. I, I, I'm going to skip Gardner just because it's late. It, we've been going, and I, I feel like Gardner is uh, ultimately um, really pretty similar to imputation-based robust estimators. Um, I wrote it up on my sub stack, and you can read about it there. Um, I kind of want to just probably, uh, let's see where we feel after this matrix completion. And, um, and then I might, might just kind of wrap it up because, um, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, um, that'll be kind of the full gamut of the differential timing papers. We could do fuzzy, but to be perfectly honest, um, I don't think that fuzzy happens as much as you think it might in your practical research. I, I could be wrong. Let me, let me explain that later. Let's do the uh, matrix completion. So the, the main part of the article, this is from, uh, Susan A. Thie. There's a bunch of people, um, Let's see, who's the authors? So we go here, we go to Nova article. Uh, nope, that's not it. Susan Athey, Bayati, Duchenko. Duchenko is a, he's at Google, okay. Uh, Embens and Kusavari. From the electrical engineering department. Okay. Uh, five authors. It's now at the Journal of American Statistical Association and uh, just came out. So they say the main point of the article is about the statistical problem of imputing the missing values of Y. Once these, once these are imputed, we can estimate the causal effect of interest. Uh, to estimate the average causal effect of the treatment on the treated, we impute the missing potential control outcomes. <coughs> so it's really similar. It's really pretty similar to the imputation-based robust estimator, but the it doesn't use a parallel trends assumption. So it doesn't depend on parallel trends. It's kind of a it's kind of an exotic estimator, to be honest. They they're really focused on synthetic control. Uh, so they're going to unite two literatures the what's called unconfoundedness literature and the synthetic control literature. Uh, it's going to combine computer science with statistics to create this uh, method called matrix completion with nuclear norm. And you can think of the nuclear norm like lasso. Think about it as a machine learning model with using uh, like a lasso model. It won't be a lasso model, but like for some people, that aren't used to this, they know they have heard of lasso as this kind of regularization procedure with this penalty. And there's a specific form to the to the lasso penalization. That's what the nuclear norm is going to be. It's going to be a linear regression with a particular kind of penalty that has certain nice properties. All right. So it's going to use nuclear norm regularization for the imputation. Right. It's just going to allow them to do the imputing. So what is it called matrix completion? They did not invent matrix completion. I, that is a, that, that's where, remember right here, they say uh, combines computer science. It, computer scientists are the ones that came up with matrix completion, I think, or maybe it was statisticians, but you saw it uh, in, not in economics. Okay, so completing a matrix is basically about imputing. It's about filling in um, it's about guessing at the correct values that are missing. Okay. So the completion part is just another name for filling in a matrix or imputing. So in causal inference, if the matrix is a matrix of potential outcomes like Y zero. Okay. So Y zero is uh, missing units due to, um, it's, it's due, due to counterfactuals. All right. So if you've got like, you know, let's say there's five, there's, you know, there's 30 of us on the call, right? 30 of us on the call, 15 of us have a PhD, 15 of us are PhD students. I'm missing the potential outcome 
for the people who have the PhD of their outcome in a world where they didn't. So I've got like 15 people observed outcomes in a world where they don't have a PhD. And I have 15 people's outcomes in a world where they have the PhD. So like I'm missing in a matrix of, of 30 people, right? 30 people, I'm missing half of the data. I'm missing the Y zeros for all of us that have a PhD. So in causal inference, the, the missingness is caused by treatment assignment. It's because it's caused by, you know, I'm, I'm missing my Y zeros because I do have my PhD. I got it in 2007. So here's a matrix of potential outcomes representing units that had not been treated, right? So this is an entire matrix. There is no missingness, right? There is no missingness. I have all 15 people or all 30 people, okay? Now imagine a treatment assignment, sattva, right? That flips treatment from zero to one in the last period. So say right here, it goes from, you know, zero to one. Then I would have that. Why are there question marks in the last column? Because I don't observe Y zero in the last column. Because uh, if the treatment flipped from zero to one, that's a zero. Sorry, that. Oh, I have this backwards. That should be a one. Oh, that should be Y one. Oh, I'm so tempted to change it right now. So that should be. That should be Y1. Okay, so let me, let me just, let me do this. There you go. All right, so see what's going on? So the treatment assignment is basically when that's a one, the observed outcome equals Y1, and when that's a zero, the observed outcome is equal to Y0. Okay, so I gotta fix that. Um, so matrix completion seeks to do the following. Fill it in. Fill in the missing counterfactuals. Get all of my outcomes and it does it at the individual level. Look, it's doing it at the individual level. So this is for unit one. This is for unit two. This is for unit I for every period. Okay. Once you have those, then you can just calculate. You have Y1, right? You have Y1. So you just say Y1 minus Y0. Y1 minus Y0. Y1 minus Y0. And then you can aggregate them. So it's still an aggregation process, but you're not aggregating the treatment effects, you're ag the aggregate treatment effects uh, at the group level. You're aggravated, aggravated, aggregating the individual level, and you're doing it based off an explicit imputation, an explicit imputation. Okay. So open. So where did matrix completion come from? This is not the history. Uh, so even though it says history, it, it's actually not the history. Um, it's a famous piece of history. It's a famous piece of history. It's pretty fun. So in 2006, Netflix had a uh, contest. Uh, it had a contest. And in this contest, um, uh, they, the winner would get a million dollars if they could improve Netflix's predictive model by 10 points on root mean squared error. What was the, what were they doing? Some of you that are that are younger may not remember this. The older people on the call will remember it. Uh, before Netflix was a streaming service, you would get discs in the mail, and when you had discs in the mail, it was it was like a huge part of the business model was what was called the queue, Q U E U E Q, and you would just queue up the um, the movies or the TV shows. Uh, you would go ahead and queue them up, and then you wouldn't have to think about it. You'd get those discs, you'd be done, you'd send them back, and then you'd be sort of surprised by the discs that came in the mail. And, um, or not surprised, you know, you'd already set it up, you could move stuff around, but, but it was presumably stuff you hadn't seen, okay? It was presumably stuff you hadn't seen. But they would recommend, they would recommend movies and TV shows to you all the time based off 
your um, rating. They would, they would base it off of your rating of a other movie. So like I would say, I like, uh, you know, the, the first Star Wars trilogy. And they would say, well, you, you would probably like um, The Last Starfighter. I don't know if you've ever seen The Last Starfighter. I grew up watching it. You would say, maybe you will like The Last Starfighter because I, I, maybe I rate Star Wars really high, but I've never even heard of The Last Starfighter. And they present it to me, right? And then, uh, and so then the question is, you know, do I like it? Did I end up liking it or not? So um, they invite a ton of competition with this contest. What they want to do is they want to have a good predictive model. Can they, can they predict? It's actually kind of a causal model. If I like it, will I give it a high score? If you show me this, will I, will I give it a high score? That's kind of a causal question because they're, the treatment is give you a movie and the outcome is, you know, do you or do you not like it? So um, uh, it invited a ton of competition from MIT faculty teams, you know, entire labs of MIT faculty and student to just regular people uh, who would work out of their home office uh, working on this because ultimately they would give data. Everybody was given this database, which was then tested by Netflix on a holdout data set. So they would have like this huge data set and um, they would give you like, They'd have some data set of like a million observations. Uh, hold on. Motion detected at the side door. Let's hope not. Since it is six o'clock in the morning. Let's see if I'm getting robbed here. Nope. Bugs. Um, so uh they, uh, everybody was given a data set. So may maybe they have a data set of a million movies, mo million movie observations, mi million people rating movies. They'd give out 750,000. They'd give this uh, data set of uh, 750,000 observations that you would fit your model on. You'd send your model back to them and then they would run it on the remaining holdout data set and see how well your model did. And if your model had a root mean squared error, meaning the prediction error, uh, that was 10 punt points, you know, lower than their algorithm, you'd win. You'd win the million dollars. Boom. And they had like a, a leaderboard and everything. And it took three years for a winner. And it was like, uh, what, what ended up happening is like people would, people would uh, combine teams and all these things. And second place won stuff. And, but there's this like gigantic spar sparsely populated ma matrix, 100 million users ranking hundred thousand movies. So it's like, uh, I like the movie, uh, silver linings playbook and Lars and the real girl. And you like silver linings playbook. These are two of my favorite movies. Yeah. Fun fact. Trungley says the winning algorithm was never implemented. Trungley, tell us why that was. Why was it never implemented? Do you know why they never implemented it? Oh, is it that it cost too much? Is that why? I thought they'd already moved to streaming. It wasn't because they'd already, it was because they were, it was because it cost too much to do it. I trust Trungley over my memory. They don't adopt it. That's crazy. Um, I, they, they don't, you know, nobody, nobody, um, I wonder if they, what they use now. I mean, they're recommending stuff all the time now too. Um, I don't really use it. Oh, that's what you heard too from learning and machine learning. Okay. Uh, so, so if I like these two movies, which by the way, these are two really great movies, uh, real, real like romantic comedies, kind of romantic comedy, romantic drama type movies. Uh, I like both of them. I love both of them. And if, and uh, I give them like five out of five and you watch silver linings playbook and you give it five out of five. Well, probably, you know, you're going to like Lars and the real girl. What, what really would hang stuff up were these really divisive movies like Napoleon Dynamite. That, that was like hugely divisive. Some people loved Napoleon Dynamite. Some people hated it. So, uh, but they had, they had to have a model that did it. So we're using correlations in the columns to complete the missing values. And when you really think about it, oh yeah, uh, I said that it's causal. 
So I didn't always think of causal inference in terms of imputation um, because, oh, is that right? I don't even remember. Grasshopper says they uh, didn't actually, now it's just thumbs up, thumbs down. Huh. There must not be a lot of information in that ranking. Rotten Tomatoes is thumbs up, thumbs down. Metacritic is five stars. Boy, I'm distracted. Okay, so uh, imputation. So I didn't always think of causal inference in terms of imputation because the method was often taking existing values and just manipulating the data rather than filling in missing values. Like, you know, the difference is with explicit imputation, there's a brand new column of, of an observation. So there's this here. Whereas with Callaway Santana, there is no new data. The data doesn't, the data doesn't change. Okay, so um, uh, the fundamental problem of causal inference states that causal inference is a missing data problem. So it, it does make sense to impute. And I tend to think, therefore, in terms of implicit and explicit imputation methods. So Kirill and uh, Xavier and, and Jan's paper is an explicit imputation. And Susan Athey uh, at all that they're more like explicit imputations because they're both going to end up with new data as will Gardner as will Gardner and uh, you know Callaway Santana is more manipulative uh, and DID methods more generally are so lots of moving parts in this interesting paper and it is uh, it is readable if you'll sit down and really study it you can get you can get your hands on it even if you're not an econometrician um, but it is kind of exotic because of all that computer science and machine learning. If you're not used to those uh, those methods, it can be a little daunting. But if you just keep at it, you'll if you if you keep at it, you'll you'll get it. Um, so lots of moving parts, and um, I want you to be competent and conversant. So we also have some R code in it, but they really make a big deal out of the fact that they're going to combine two literatures. The unconfoundedness literature uh, sometimes will explicitly impute uh, missing counterfactuals. Wait, what's the difference? I always see it being in parentheses. I always say, you know, let me, let's look at what Inbins and Rubin do. Let's see what they do. It's like 260. They're probably going to use a W. Yeah, so let's put it up here. Yeah, I think that they do not use that second one. This is not working. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is not working. Is it over here? It's at the bottom. There it is. You see that? That was horrible. This is not how to do stuff. Um, but Inbins and Rubin use how I'm doing. It's just D. Oh, it's just D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just D. It's it's just Y zero Y one uh, or thought independent, uh, independent of D conditional on X. It's basically just saying once you condition on X. And here the, the notation is supposed to mean statistical independence. Um, once you condition on the X covariates, all remaining variation in D is random, random or independent, which I think is usually going to just be like random. And I've, I always think, is that the same thing? And um, it just means that it's independent of Y0, Y1. So, you know, it could be randomness with respect to Y0, Y1. Um, and there are in the unconfoundedness literature in the matching literature, sometimes you do have explicit imputation, like with nearest neighbor, 
So like in the nearest neighbor papers uh, by like Imbens and Root, uh, Imbens and uh, Abadier and Imbens, they'll impute a missing counterfactual. Or you can do it with propensity score too. Uh, sometimes it's more implicit, like with the inverse probability weighting. Okay, but there's this unconfoundedness literature. And then there's the synthetic control, which is literally calculating a counterfactual as a weighted average over all donor pool units. And their matrix completion nearest neighbor method is going to show that both of those are nested within the general framework they've developed, making them actually special cases. Synthetic control is a special case of their matrix completion method. It's kind of interesting. I didn't know that. I've studied synthetic control since 2011 and that would have never occurred to me this is why i'm not an econometrician this is why i'm not an econometrician nothing like this ever i can only read papers i cannot create them y'all can probably create them but uh i i don't why what's the hmm about grasshopper tell me what tell me what you're thinking Something, something doesn't feel right. I want to hear what Grasshopper has to say. I'm going to teach Grasshopper and then you, when you post what it is that doesn't feel right, I'll go back to your, your observation. So um, the differences, conceptually they're different in the way they exploit patterns. Okay. They're going to, they're going to exploit patterns differently. Unconfoundedness comes uh, from assuming that patterns are stable over that, that patterns over time are stable across units synth assumes patterns across units are stable over time all right so the regularization particularly this nuclear norm is going to nest them both as a special case of matrix completion Ma matrix completion with the nuclear norm oh good all right perfect so the gist, they're going to use these factor models and interactive fixed effects that model the observed outcome as the sum of a linear function of covariates and an unobserved component that is a low rank matrix plus some noise. And um, if I'm understanding it correctly, synthetic control explicitly does that. There's explicitly a factor model and that factor model models the counterfactual. Okay. Estimates are typically based on minimizing the sum of squared residuals given the rank of the matrix of unobserved components with the rank itself, with you estimating the rank. So you're going to estimate the rank itself. It's going to be some low rank matrix. And then given that low rank matrix, you're going to estimate uh, the missing counterfactuals using, using a linear model, using OLS. So the formal results, there's three contributions to the formal, uh, to this paper. First is formal results for non-random missingness uh, when the block structure allows for correlation over time. So, I think it's the second one. I don't know if they're the same. I definitely know it's the second one. I've never seen it expressed as the first one. No, the, the potential outcomes do not, are not independent of of X. That almost looks like the propensity score. But the even the propensity score is the second one. So, you know, X is not... Although, once you condition on... That almost is... That, that looks like the propensity score theorem. That first one. Once, but except it's missing the propensity score because... In the propensity score theorem, uh, you've got y0, y1 independent of d conditioned on x. And uh, once you do that, you estimate the propensity score. y0, y, x is independent of d conditional on p of x. Basically, whether the conditional operator distributes over the independent operator. I'm not sure uh, off the top of my head, Grasshopper. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that and work it out. But uh, I know the second is the formal presentation in 
that that is I know that the second is the conditional independence assumption. I don't know how that relates to the first one. I don't know how it does. Because technically, once you condition on X, the uh, once you condition on X, once you condition on D, conditional on X, X is no longer, well, I know the second is true. I don't know about the first. If the first, I'm sorry, I just, I just don't know. Okay. Um, so formal results are going to be allowing for this uh, block structure is going to allow for correlation over time. That's going to be the role of the nuclear norm. And uh, then they're going to show that uh, synthetic control and unconfoundedness are actually matrix completion methods. Uh, they're going to have the same objective function. And each approach is just going to impose different sets of restrictions on the factors in the matrix formalization. Factorization, ma matrix completion with near nearest neighbor doesn't impose any restrictions. Uh, it just imposes regularization to characterize the estimator. Okay, so they, they consider that to be a nesting. Um, and then the last is uh, they're going to apply it to two data sets, but I'm, I skipped that because I, I don't know. One, it took me, I kind of stuck to the theory, but basically the method finds that compared to synthetic control and the other, and d, they say, they call it diff and diff, which I guess is two-way fixed effects that I couldn't quite figure that out, um, is uh, more, has lower prediction, has lower prediction error. So there's lots of jargon in this article. They got unconfoundedness, vertical and horizontal regression, fat and thin matrices. Unfortunately, you need to learn all of it. So let me try to organize it. You're gonna define the matrix first in terms of a block structure, which is describing where and when the missingness occurs. And basically what you're working with is, best I can tell, you're working from irreversible treatments. So much of the unconfoundedness literature focuses on lots of units being treated in the last period. So you think about Lone's 1986 article, the NSW treats the workers, and then you don't observe Y0 for the treated group in the last period. It's that simple two by two case, okay? This is called the single treated period block structure because there's only gonna be one treated period because only one period is missing. There it is. This is the single treated period block structure. Notice we're missing uh, units in the last period, all right? So I get treated in 1996, all right? Single treated block structure. Notice the synthetic control design by comparison. It's treated at any period, but it's you're missing the observations post-treatment. So you got one unit that is treated, and then the counterfactual Y0 is not observed after that. Okay, so you got two kinds, look, two kinds. Unconfoundedness has the single treated period, synthetic control, one unit, single treated unit. It should be single, treat, single treated unit block structure, All right? And then you have staggered adoption. You have units getting treated at different points in time. So all of these so-called designs can be expressed in terms of missingness in the block structure. And our job, therefore, is to find an estimator that is general enough to manage all of them. And their matrix completion nearest neighbor will be that. Okay? Their matrix completion nearest neighbor will be that. So we also have to consider the relative number of panel units and time periods because this also shapes which regression style will be used for imputation. So you've got thin and fat matrices. So if, do you have a lot of units or do you have a lot of time? So my conditionally accepted JHR, uh, fingers crossed, it uses 400 panel units and 180 months. So I had more panel units than T, and that means it's a thin matrix because the more panel units means it's longer or wider. What's the right way to think of it? A lot longer, longer. It's vertically long, but it's not very wide. So that makes it thin. But if you had like lots of, but like my, my review of economic studies on uh, prostitution or sex work legalization 
it was 51 state units over like 40 years. It went from 1960 to 50 years. So it was like, you know, this many that long. And that's called wide. All right. So there's two special combinations of missing data patterns, vertical and horizontal regression. So this is thin and fat matrices. This is actually your data. And then your, that's just a description of your data. And then this is a description of your regression. Okay. So there's two special combinations of um, missing data patterns and matrix shape that need special attention because they're the focus of these two large literatures. Unconfoundedness has that single treated period block structure with a thin matrix. And you're going to use a large number of units and, and impute missing potential outcomes in the last period for the thin matrix uh, with similar lagged outcomes. And the horizontal regression, imagine just running OLS on the lags and predicted values. The horizontal regression will hold under con confoundedness and the vertical regression will hold under synthetic control. So Duchenko and Pinto, Duchenko and Embens and Pinto and Furman, they show that, that the classic uh, synthetic control paper in JASA by Avadier, Diamond, and Haymuller, it can be interpreted as regressing the outcomes for the treated period to treatment on the outcomes for controls in the same period. Both horizontal and vertical regression exploit patterns in the data. An alternative to each of them is to consider an approach that allows for the exploitation of both stable patterns over time and stable patterns across time to kind of combine them, to kind of combine them. And this is where their matrix completion with nearest neighbor model comes in. Uh, nearest neighbor model, nuclear, nuclear, uh, nuclear norm. I'm looking at this thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Some, uh, synthetic diff and diff. Yeah, I think synthet. I don't. I don't remember the synthetic diff and diff. But, oops. But uh, uh, long t long thua thu post this. This is really good. So we should. This is probably something I should have incorporated into the talk. Um, this is so many papers. Just so many papers to do. There's also the, uh, what is it called? Changes and changes uh, model. Uh, there's the diff and diff and there's the changes and changes model. So this is where their matrix completion with nuclear norm model comes in. It does this. It exploits patterns cross-sectionally and longitudinally. All right. So we're going to model the N by T matrix of complete outcomes data matrix. Why? as uh, a matrix that we're going to estimate plus some error term and the error conditional on this matrix that we're going to estimate will be equal to zero so just think of the error term as measurement error that's what they say uh, if you need a framework to think about it so you're going to have this complete matrix that you've estimated that's going to have zero mean conditional independence all right so assumption one error will be independent of this matrix and the elements of E will be uh, sigma sub Gaussian and independent of each other. Lots of matrix forms apparently can be defined this way, but just don't get lost in it. We are still just trying to estimate L star. That's the main storyline. Okay. Uh, that's the main storyline. So we have this, it's sort of an odd assumption, but it has to do with the error term and how the error term of the L, error term conditional on L star, how the nature of that independence. Okay. So you can impute something a million different ways. So you could have values for every period being one, 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 one. And then you could say the impute, the, the value of the, the fifth period is the sum. And that doesn't look like that would be right. It looks to me like, uh, that, that, you know, we, we might think that the fifth value is a one. So you could minimize the sum of squared differences, but if the objective function doesn't depend on Y star, this is one of the things that Embens told me, the estimator would just spit back Y and the Sigma, the treatment effect would be a zero. So there's like certain estimators that they consider where, uh, the 
treatment effects end up being zero. Elastic net apparently is like that. So what they do is they add in a penalty term to the objective function. But even then, even then not all of them perform well. So it turns out it actually matters whether you regular lot regular as the fixed effects or not. So it just like it matters whether or not you regularize the constant. Uh, I kind of just took their word for it because I've never had a machine learning class. I know that um, I know that who was it said they had that Trump Trungley said that. So Trungley may have known this already. Uh, how lasso will uh, uh, depends on whether or not you regularize the constant. It's going to depend on whether or not you regularize the fixed effect. They are not going to regularize the fixed effect. So this is going to be their objective function. Uh, they're going to have L star that's going to depend on fixed effects. Okay, it's going to depend on fixed effects. And here's going to be the objective function. And there's the nuclear norm. Okay, there's the nuclear norm right there. So the penalty will likely be the nuclear norm. But notice that the fixed effects are outside the penalty term. Here they are. There's the fixed effects. They're outside the penalty term. Uh, you could subsume them into the matrix. They, that's what they say, but they don't recommend doing it. So the fraction of observations is res relatively high. So the fixed effects can actually be estimated separately. Uh, apparently that is one difference between the nuclear norm and the rest of the matrix completion literature. They typically will subsume these other uh, types of parameters into the, the matrix completion. And then you're going to choose the penalty using this cross-validation method. So one of the things I thought was interesting uh, was that the nuclear norm uh, allowed for the construction of a low rank matrix, but these other norms had weird properties. And I, this is again what I remember. I was, I was talking to I went out to Stanford to present a paper, that one that was conditionally accepted at JHR. And um, I went out to um, Stanford and I asked him, why are you using nuclear norm? Why couldn't you use some of the stuff that I've heard of, like elastic net or lasso and uh, or ridge? He said, uh, he said, elastic net would spit out all zeros. And I remember thinking, why in the world did I think I would understand what he tells me when I ask this question? So they're all performing very strange. So one advantage of, near, of uh, nuclear norm is that it's fast. And convex optimization programs will do it, whereas some of the others won't because of the large N or large T issues. And it, there's almost like a crosswalk between this and Borsak, but I don't quite see it. Partly because Borsak is not assuming this and it's not using regularization. It's not using regularization, but they're both doing imp imputation. So it would be really interesting to see how Borsak's paper performs relative to matrix completion. I would be really fascinated by that, but um, to my knowledge, it hasn't been. So let's review the R code. Uh, it uses a command in R called gsynth. I'm just going to look at the Ching and Hoekstra paper uh, because, frankly, it's the data set I know. And ultimately, this is just another model that can be used for differential timing. It, multiple imputation. Uh, they, they don't explore multiple imputation. Do you mean imputing missing, non mit like, Missingness that is not due to the to the missing counterfactual, like a, like an imbalance panel. They they don't look at it. They're only treating missingness as coming from counterfactuals. So uh, they I don't know if they you know how it would perform, but they don't they don't look at that. They don't look at that. And in my JHR, we, we balance too. So I'm not really sure. Um, Borsak. Borsak, I think, would be balancing also because, you know, um, maybe not. I bet you could do it for Borsak. 
Although you'd be estimating fixed effects off of missing observables. So I don't actually know how that would perform. Actually, that, that might be a problem too, especially when you start filling in. So I bet you, I bet you there's some strong restrictions that you have to place on that, that form of missingness, even in Borsox at all paper. Uh, so I can't really answer questions about when to use it and when not to, because I haven't seen any simulations that compare them. Maybe that's something some of you guys could do, especially some of the graduate students. It would be kind of interesting to see how this estimator performs in differential timing relative to some of these other robust estimators. Um, Cause this is designed for differential timing too, but they don't compare it uh, cause they're just focused on unconfoundedness and, uh, and synthetic control. And neither of those are the identifying assumptions for diff and diff. So it's, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, you choose this. All right. So let's look at it. Let's go to R and I think I got to pull it up. I actually want to do something. I, I had to fix this. So I want to use just this thing. It's in the workshop. Yeah, it was in there. All right. All right, so let's um, let's look at this. This is um, Grant McDermott and Scott Cunningham. The original one I had was had a lot of redundant stuff in it. Grant, you know, can see right through it. So uh, we're gonna install a couple of different things. We're at Haven is gonna be installed because that's how you load in a state of data set. So I'm gonna load in this state of data set. And let me just go ahead and give you Oh, actually, shoot. Um, this is all in the, um, this is all in the, uh, that's kind of interesting. Hold on. Let me save it in Coachella. That's where you want to put it. Coachella programs. Okay. And let me just upload this to you guys. So if you just repull that GitHub, if you just repull it, um, it'll uh, be up to date and it'll have the better one. Okay. If you and if you want to know where that GitHub is, go back to Causal Inference the Remix and go down to the Coachella announcement, and it's uh, here, right there. Okay. So you just copy that in, and you can download it. All right. So I uh, used. Um, Let's use, um, oh, look at that. Okay. So it ran the whole thing. Read in the data set, do the cross validation 10 times. Now do the bootstrapping and let me show you the results. So, uh, here's what you get. Uh, you get a smaller average treated on the treated. You're getting this bigger standard error. The other methods are not getting such large standard errors and actually are getting slightly bigger effects. Um, and uh, we also have things in relative event time. So uh, the um, we're finding these relatively small effects here and the positive effects are coming here and it's not quite significant, not quite significant, okay? 
So that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Um, and uh, I think that it needs, so there was only 50 states over 10 years. So that makes it a, uh, that makes it a thin matrix. That makes it a thin matrix. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the rest of this just because I am a little tired and uh, I don't think the um, the fuzzy design I don't think the fuzzy design is worth it. Uh, maybe I'll change my mind, but uh, not not now. So we've already been going for four hours. So so here's the concluding remarks. Okay. There's still more work, you know, to be done in, in a seminar like this. None of John Roth's work was in here. Um, there's various fixed effects papers that I think would be really useful to cover too. Uh, but point is, you're going to write papers using diff and diff, right, in your life. Probably more than one. If you're a graduate student, one of the things that you kind of get from the lessons here is I'm just throwing this out there. You get um, uh, maybe the ones that use differential timing could stand to be updated, could stand to be updated. So there, there might be some low hanging fruit um, for you, like maybe in a, a second year paper, uh, even if it was just a literature review, just to kind of see you know how strong these results are. are. So even if you don't write them though, um, even if you don't write them, you're still going to read them. You're still going to read these papers and um, you're going to read a lot of them. They use diff and diff. You're going to referee them. You're going to advise students to use them. You're going to have students that use them. Okay. You're going to have speakers that come using them. And it's in your best in interest to make the fixed cost investment in this new met in this new literature because the, the mo old methods are mostly harmless, harmful. So the good news is we are at the conclusion of this wave of papers for the most part. Uh, you know, there's like always going to be these little tweaks, but if you look at the performance of each of these models, they're pretty similar. You know, they really differ not so much with respect to bias, but with respect to efficiency and the good news and then computational speed. So the good news is uh, solutions tend to have common features. Don't use the already treated as controls. Uh, overall presentations tend to be the same, get static and dynamic specifications. So they're not really all that different. Uh, two by two has its own problems when estimated using two way fixed effects. If you include covariates, um, stronger assumptions are needed to include covariates. Don't control for covariates that could be affected by the outcome. Uh, Use something like Santana and Zhao, which allows for you to estimate the average treated on the treated with covariates not needing the additional assumptions. So the main problem with differential timing is heterogeneity, both uh, over time and cross-sectionally, uh, and the use of already treated units as controls. Um, if you have any reason to believe homogeneous treatment effects uh, hold from theory, fine. Use two-way fixed effects. But with differential timing, you really shouldn't because it is biased and it doesn't obey a no sign flip property. Weights can be negative. Uh, Callaway Santana has additional benefits like examining heterogeneous responses by timing. This is part of the value of defining these target parameters as weighted averages. So these causal cl claims, they depend on valid assumptions, uh, high quality, appropriate data, appropriate estimators, Use this opportunity to have uh, fun, learn new things. Don't sweat whether you learned everything in this seminar. Check out my Substack for simple explanations. Go back to the papers, talk to the authors, um, have fun. Remember applied work is exciting. Uh, don't sweat it. Don't forget how great it is to learn something new. Don't forget that season two of Ted Lasso came out last week. Um, feels the same, but different. All right, so that's it. Uh, that's it for Coachella. Um, I did all the differential timing papers and the covariate papers. Um, I'm gonna continue to add continuous treatment. And when I add in continuous treatment, then I can cover fuzzy. Even though fuzzy is not about continuous treatment, it does 
have a specific application that will let you use fuzzy designs. Um, but thank you. Uh, I appreciate your time and uh, hope that this has been helpful. Uh, I will post all of this to the, um, I will post all of this to uh, um, YouTube. Okay. So uh, you guys have a good weekend uh, and I'll hope to see you around. Goodbye.